Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another special edition of the Second City Podcast. Uh, my name's Daniel. I'm here, as always, with uh, Callum. I'm a Blue Nose. He's a villain. Something a little bit different this week, though. Obviously, normally we uh, we kind of keep up to date with like the current goings on and like you know our, our recent matches and transfer window and and all that stuff. But yeah. currently, as uh, as this is going out to the world, Callum is stuck at the top of a mountain somewhere <laughs> in the Austrian Alps. Uh, Callum's on holiday in Austria. Oh, are you on holiday? Are you going to be on? Yeah, holiday yeah. And I'm, I'm on a skiing uh, holiday. Yeah. Oh, oh well, my okay <laughs> um, so this is uh unfortunately so we, well not unfortunately but we couldn't do less like a normal episode this week um so instead we're going to do one of our second city stories it's been a little while since we did one mm-hmm. and this week we're doing uh steve bruce so the theme of this series is we take a look at someone who's maybe as a player or as a manager has represented both blues and villa in some capacity and we um and we look at their time at both clubs and their sort of legacy and so on uh, so yeah, this week's Bruce obviously has a huge legacy at both clubs, certainly with Blues anyway. Um, had a big impact at both clubs and obviously the, his time at both clubs was quite a long time apart. So quite interesting looking at different points in his career and so on and whether it was a success or failure. So we'll get onto all that later and we'll recap um, Bruce's time at Blues and Villa in a bit and take that trip down memory lane and so on. But first of all, uh, we're going to start, as we always do, with what we're wearing. But we have gone with, obviously, sort of Bruce-themed era shirts, I think, by the look of things, Cal. Yes, absolutely. I feel like Mm. you've been guessing first a lot recently. Yeah. But I think we're going to keep it, because we've got to do your shirt (laughs) second this week, because that is is a classic second seat kit. Pulled out the big gun this week. You have pulled out the big guns this week. Um, my one is a nice claret and blue Under Armour piece, uh, Inuit QuickBook sponsor, uh, and a lovely button collar. We haven't had one mm. of these. I was thinking about this earlier. The like, we never have collared shirts, and like this one is like as good as it'll get. Yeah, that sort of one button collar thing kind of came back into fashion a few years ago. I feel well, it's like. actually two. There's a claret button here as oh, well. Right. Um, but yeah, it, what there was like a fashionable bit around this period where mm. quite a few clubs were having like the college shirt yeah um well obviously it's bruce era and he was with you for a few seasons sort of mid to late 2010s um i think that's your first season back in the championships so i'm going to say 2016 17 when you finished like mid table on the money Oh man, I'm on fire. That's you you are on fire the last couple <laughs> of weeks. Like, like... <laughs> Is it? yeah, it's a bit embarrassing. Maybe that's the thing. I'm wearing two modern kits. I need to go back to the ones from like the 50s and uh, you <laughs> yeah, stopped again. I struggled on them. <laughs> yeah, I struggled with those. Um, no. What are your memories of that time then? Uh, I mean, footballing wise, terrible. This is probably when I had like one of the biggest disconnects between football. Uh, and like, but we were at uni this year. This is would have been mm, our second kind of, year at uni. Yeah, didn't go to as many games and stuff. To know it's really noticed. But I was thinking through it. I think this season yeah. I went to like three or four games, which is mad. I did one game this season, mm-hmm. which was the Second City Derby at Villa Park, which was the day I bought this shirt. I got it in the twenty oh, really? quid in the end of year sale. Um, wow. Really hoping I was going to get to see Gianfranco Zola and instead had to watch <laughs> Harry Redknapp. Harry Redknapp, yeah, yeah. <laughs> his first game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, which was, um, that was a great experience because that was the first time I'd been to Villa Park since the final day of the 14 15 season. Wow. Um, wow. Which was when we lost to Burnley 1 0. Danny Ings got the winner, which I talked about, I think, last week, just before the cup final. Yeah, because the, fol- the following year, we was it was our first year at uni. And so uh, I did two games but they were both the away days in southampton which is where i was at uni so and yeah, cool. I, I would have done the second city derby in the cup that year but it was the first week of uni it was fresh as week and I yeah couldn't go. i was furious i was furious yeah. yeah like i remember yeah it was like my third or fourth night at uni i dragged some people to the pub to watch this game they didn't give a crap about, <laughs> about yeah. the game i was like we're watching this game yeah, yeah. but no um what i remember that second city derby wasn't televised as well really bizarre yeah, it wasn't. Like, yeah, but I think it was because we were so bad that year, and yeah, you were rubbish as well. And when they did the TV picks, you maybe weren't going down at that point. Yeah, uh, there was, and, yeah. 
And then obviously you went into sort of free fall, got Harry Redknapp, but they'd already done the TV pick. So it was just one of those non-televised games. But mm. I'll never forget being outside the ground. Like I just bought my shirt and like you're getting excited. And we looked at the team news and I saw uh, Gabby Bonhoeffer was back in the squad and he was on the bench. I remember saying to our friend Liam, who I went to the game with, I said, I was, I was like, I want to put a bet on on my phone because Gabby's going to score today on Turnier and like, the Gabby Bonhoeffer's legacy at Villa was in ruins at this point. Nobody gave a shit anymore. He was he was like the forgotten man. And um, but the classic Villa Park signal meant I couldn't open the app on my phone. It just wouldn't have it, and so I never put the bet on. Um, oh. So how yeah. much? How much do you reckon you would have landed if you'd put it on? Probably not. Well, I probably wouldn't have put more than like a few quid <laughs> He's on it. He's a striker, so, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. Right. But like, I, I reckon of all of the games I, I could have got odds on for Gabby to score and Villa to win, that probably would have been pretty good odds for him because it was right at the tail end. Um, mm. But that was a great moment. That was one of my, that's one of my favourite Villa Park moments was like that sort of Bon Lahore redemption arc where he came off the bench with like 10 minutes to go and scored like a really scrappy winner and the place just went mad. And like, you know, even though I hadn't been to many games, we had quite a few on telly over those seasons in the championship. Like no one was singing his name, and yet the whole place was singing his name that day. Um, yeah. I saw Doctor Tony Gere, the the old owner. Like he was, he walked onto the pitch. He was only like, like he was within like a few meters away. Really, he was only a few rows in front of me. So uh, that's, I think that's like the only time I ever saw him. Um, oh wow. wow! But yeah, like him walking around, going like. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure. You don't have a clue what's going on. You <laughs> fraud, <laughs> you con man. Um, <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, but I absolutely love this shirt. It's one of my favourite Villa shirts. Might be you know, a bit of a rogue one to throw out there. I've had a lot of wear out of this. And we have just changed our branding on uh, the Second City podcast, but this was the shirt that was in oh, the yeah, original course, branding. Because yeah. it course, was when yeah, we were outside the, uh, the fountain in Malta. Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Um, very good. Let's get on to the real event, though. Come on. Yeah, I think I think you've you've trumped. It. I mean, this is classic, classic shirts, isn't it? And that's an original as well. Le Coq Sportif. Le Coq Sportif. Um, phones, phones for, for you. you. Blue with like a kind of black on like some of the sleeves yeah. and stuff, and on the collar. Yeah. Like, like I was thinking, I, I, like as we've gone through some of these kits, like the two like sponsors that are like so iconic for me of growing up in the second city on the blue shirts is phones for you and flyby but the thing about yeah. phones for you i remember the old advert it, it was it, like phones for you yeah, yeah i think it's because it's so it is so dated now it's yeah. like it is such a product of its time like i think that's why it's so uh but what year do you think it is it's it's gotta be early 2000s i i, I you know what what I, I said this the other week as well is you have just such a rogue kit makers like you had an x10 <laughs> you know. have lonsdale and you got the cock sportive yeah like, again oh. another total product of its time i think yeah. yeah um i think it's gotta be around somewhere like 2003 2004 one year out this is 2002 oh. three this is Probably top three all time blues kits. It is, of course, yeah. on my famous. Um, oh, yeah. Kits through Birmingham the years. City kits, uh, kits through the years uh, poster behind me. Uh, this is our first year in the Premier League. Beat Villa 3 0 at home. Peter Enkelman with one of the great moments. Beat them 2 0 away uh, at Villa Park. Uh, you know, Jeff, Jeff Horsfield like bopping the ball away from That's Enkelman, the, the running head the keeper and scoring. The, the Dion well, Dublin headbutt. Yeah. Uh, Christoph Dugary. Stan Lazaridis, Robbie Savage, Aliou Cisse, Stern John, Clinton Morrison, Stephen Clements, Kenny Cunningham. Like, my, like, so we finished 13th and obviously had the two wins over Villa, which were, like, by all accounts, like, incredible. And, like, you watch them back and they are, like, amazing. But we actually went on a really poor run of form. Um, and then Dugary, you know, World Cup winner, Euros winner turned up and... um mentioned on the podcast last week that um i asked stephen carr at uh, the evening with stephen carr if you could play with one blues player before or after your time that you didn't get the chance to play with who would it be and he said dugary and the guy came in we won four games in a row and it propelled us um uh you know to safety my only regret with all this is that we were like young children <laughs> like I, I like don't like remember it 
um you know it's one i've seen on the vhs a million times i've seen on youtube a million times i wish i was kind of obviously i was a lot older with the cup final but similarly i wish i was older for these things and i could like really appreciate these things um a lot more but yeah like uh unreal kit shout out to uh james for lending me this one again just phenomenal kit and just like Football kits when they were like baggy and like that sort of era, they just looked different, didn't it? it just looked better, yeah, yeah. you know. The, the material's looked... so different though. The, I'd say they're not as comfortable maybe as no. like modern kits. It, who cares though? This is um, you know, like yeah, all time classic kit and uh, proper Bruce era. So yeah, two thousand and two, three home shirt. This is outrageous. Even kit. the badges in a shield as well. Like yeah, it's so it's mental, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just so like yeah, products of its time. If you think as well, like. So this was 2002, so that's 22 years ago. If you think of the time gap between, like, now and then, so yeah, 22 years, think the current kit now, the, like, that time difference will be 22 years in the future, so that would be 2046 is, like, the equivalent, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, like, that time jump again. It feels like so, that feels, sounds like so far away, this kit is that time distance away? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making much sense here, but I think you maybe yeah. get the gist of what I'm saying. It's, um, we're it's really old, is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, great season, great, great time. Steve Bruce, a three time Premier League champion who also won an additional three FA Cups and two League Cups as a player. He'd make 84 league appearances for Birmingham City between 1996 and 1998 before going on to manage them from December 2001. That would prove to be a crazy year for the former Manchester United captain, having three managerial jobs in 10 months, resigning from Wigan Athletic after losing the second division playoffs before a whirlwind three month stint at Crystal Palace when Birmingham City came calling. After two promotions, a relegation and a fallout with the ownership of St Andrews, he'd leave the Blues in November 2007 for a then world record compensation fee of £3 million for Wigan Athletic. But he wasn't finished managing in the second city. In October 2016, after a second stint at Wigan and spells at Sunderland and Hull City, Steve Bruce was appointed as manager of Aston Villa. But two years later he was sacked after a run of one win in ten matches following a playoff final defeat to Fulham the previous season. A short stint at Sheffield Wednesday before a shock move to Newcastle saw him hit 1,000 games in club management. His most recent job was back in the West Midlands again, this time with West Bromwich Albion from February 2022. However, eight months later, he was sacked with the club 22nd in the Championship. Oh, Bruce, man. He is like the big guns of players and managers to do the cross city divide and he didn't just do it <laughs> in the west midlands no yeah he's, he does it he everywhere did, time um, where? Uh, did he do the um, did he, Sheffield he did sheffield yeah. very briefly but yeah he did do it and yeah and obviously he did blues villa and west brom, oh, west brom. um he's... yeah the guy has no morals at all <laughs> <laughs> the guy's merciless um, but yeah, just thought it'd be cool to have a bit of a reflection on on Bruce and his legacy at both clubs and so on. Um, should we start with, I guess, should we start with Blues? Obviously, he managed Yeah, I think we'll Blue, go chronologically uh, through it, yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, it's kind of mad, obviously, like, he first came to Blues in 1996, so we weren't even, like, born. But I was kind of looking into, like, how that must have been. So he was the Man United captain before that, and then he came to Blues, who were in the second division, and... Maybe we're knocking on the door of playoffs and stuff, but we haven't been in the Premier or the first division, now the Premier League, for like well over 10 years, like, oh, well, about 10 years. So the only thing I could really think of even to compare that to is like, you know, when like John Terry went to Villa. Yeah, the only other one I had was Rio Ferdinand going to QPR. Weren't QPR in the Premier League, though? They were, like yeah. It wasn't, uh, it's more in, akin to John Terry, yeah. Yeah, like it's just a really mad, that must have been such, must have been such a coup. Um, and apparently the rumour, like, at the time was, you know, like, uh, this really worked out, but you know, like, how when Troy Deeney just went to Forest Green Rovers or when Rooney went to Derby, he's there was player coach or something like that, or they're a player, but they're so obviously being primed for the manager job. Um, and I, I think a lot of people suspected that was the case here with Bruce coming to Blues. Like, why would he come to Blues? Like, you know, unless there's something deeper going on. Um, but yeah, he actually left... Uh, he played for the club for, I think he played nearly 90 times, I think we said. 
um, scored a few goals, but ended up going to Sheffield United as a manager um, or to manage them and ended up uh, going to a few clubs before Blues pinched him again off Crystal Palace in 2001. And Blues were actually um, pretty mid-table. I think we were ninth or 10th when he came in and he had half a season to, you know, we'd kind of knocked on the playoffs door a few times, got into the playoff semi-finals, never made it to the final. And within six months, he had us promoted, which is pretty remarkable, really. Beat Norwich in the playoff final at the Millennium Stadium and famously beat Millwall in the semi-final away. He scored, uh, I think it was Stern John scored in like the absolute... It was it was when the playoffs had away goals in it and he scored... Was it was it on away goals? I think we were going out on away goals and then he scored uh, to make it 2-1 on aggregate, which sent us through, which is pretty mental. Um, by all accounts, it was a pretty insane night. Um, and then... Bruce's like legacy at Blues is mainly the Premier League years, though I think I talked to him what we're wearing about this season, 0203, where we finished 13th, and everyone had us written off. Everyone said we were going to go down, as they often do with the team that wins the playoffs. Yeah. But a huge achievement to to keep us up for one season. And then the second season, we really kicked up a gear. We brought in players like David Dunn and Mikhail Fussell on loan. Actually started the season really well. I remember we beat Newcastle away 1-0. Um I think it was it uh, Spurs we beat at home as well. All in like the early weeks of the season, we were really setting a statement. And this season we actually ended up finishing tenth, but which obviously was a huge achievement to be promoted and within two years finish tenth is a huge achievement. But it's actually quite misleading because we were we had such a good season that we um, were actually fifth as late as I think um, probably like late March, early April, and so. For us to finish 10th, we had a real kind of tail off at the end of the season and really dropped back. But still some great games that year. This year, we we drew Villa 2-2 away when we scored in the last minute to equalise. Uh, Stern John again scoring in the last minute to draw 2-2. Must have been I, another game I wish I'd been like older for and could have maybe been at or seen live. I, it must have been amazing. Um, and that was probably like the peak for Bruce in terms of us really propelling ourselves up the football pyramid. The following season, we finished 12th. We brought in, like, kind of the club's spending really got bigger. Like, what, uh, we brought in our record transfer fee with, like, Heskey coming in. And it was seen as a real statement of intent. And, like, we were just going to keep growing and probably, uh, you know, push for Europe and so on. And we ended up finishing 12th. Another good season. We did the double over Villa, beat them 2-1 away, 2-0 at home. We beat West Brom 4-0. Uh, we had a really good run around sort of Christmas time. But uh, I think we beat Liverpool. Did we beat? I think we did the double over Liverpool this season as well. Um but on the whole, it's weird like how we finished 10th in 0304 and 12th in 0405. Sounds very similar, but it's actually kind of very different seasons in a way. And mm. in our second season in the Premier League, we were really up there all season and kind of tailed away at the end. The following season was kind of the reverse of that. We were very much in kind of the mid lower table for a lot of the season and then had enough results to kind of bump us up to like 12th, which looks very respectable. So I think it was seen as a slight disappointment, but on the whole, Bruce has been there for three years and, you know, we've just about stayed, you know, at three solid seasons, no major relegation battles, almost have seemed very positive. Following season where Bruce easily had his worst season. So Bruce was at the club for like around six years and the 05 06 season is, is by far the worst, like unquestionably. It's the only one which is a clear failure. Um, I, I remember that the season review, like DVD, uh, of the previous season ends with a phrase like I can't remember exactly, but it's something like, you know, the future was bright, or the only way. Was <laughs> <on."> <laughs> so obviously, in our fourth season in the Premier League, obviously we got relegated, uh, finished eighteenth. So that was his history. Full his Premier League time at Blues was thirteenth, tenth, twelfth, eighteenth. So that was a huge drop off. We were. This is the first season I really remember, like, kind of clearly, if you know what I mean. I remember like specific memories from. Um, and we'd lost players like Robbie Savage had left the year before Mikhail Fussell's injury record really wasn't all that and then you start relying on players like we we had some good players come in like I remember like Yuri Yarashik came in this year and so on but um, uh, I mean it says a lot that's the (laughs) (laughs) that's the level (laughs) yeah but uh, yeah we just lost some key players in key areas and then Players like Julian Gray and Walter Pandiani and a really out of form Emil Heskey were like getting a lot more game time. And Blues were just a disaster. It was the first time you beat us in the Premier League. Uh, we lost 7 0 to Liverpool in the FA Cup quarter final. Um, and it, I remember 
even as like a, we would have been like like eight or nine years old in this season. I remember even at the time feeling like, yeah, like as an optimistic child, I was still like, man, we are bad. Like, yeah. um, like, um, although bizarrely, I think I mentioned this on another podcast, we beat Portsmouth 5-0 this season. Yeah. And it was the first time I ever watched Match of the Day and I didn't know what the score was. And we I turned it on and we were on first and we won 5-0. And I was like, yeah, this is every week. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously. <laughs> like, yeah. We've never won 5 nil since. We really are the best team in the world when we sing it at the ground. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, uh, but yeah, Blues, yeah, we got relegated. I think our last game was against, was it against Bolton? No, yeah, our last game was against Bolton. And I think we got relegated against, we drew nil-nil against Newcastle and Everson, I think it was. And we got relegated. Um, and yeah, it was the first time in Blues's, uh, Bruce's Blues career where he'd had like real adversity he'd come up against. And a lot of questions were being asked of him, but the board like kept faith in him and we, we went down and he completely reinvented the squad. Obviously we went down and we had the pedigree of coming down with parachute payments and having some premier league level players, but a lot of players left like Heskey left permanently, Jermaine Pennant went to Liverpool and so on, but he used the money. And obviously we did have the biggest budget in the championship, but he used it in the right ways. We got players like Nicholas Bentner in on loan. It's actually this kit behind me, which I wore last week, 06 or 07, um, was that season. Uh, brought players in on loan from Arsenal, Mwamba, Larson, Bentner were all unreal. I remember Bentner scored the winner in, in the first game of the season against uh, Colchester, I think it was. And um, Gary McSheffrey came in from Coventry. And yeah, he just rebuilt the team and kept key players like Stephen Clements and Mike Taylor. And then with this young, fresh blood, the team was a, it, it was a really exciting team to watch. And we ended up finishing second. Should have won the league, as I mentioned last week. We we really should have won it and let it really drop the ball in the last game. So we deserved a lot of credit for getting through another sticky patch in sort of October, November that season. And we went on like an insane run into the new year. I remember we beat, I think it was Sheffield tonight. We beat 4-2 away. We beat Newcastle 5-1 in the FA Cup. We beat West Brom 2-0 at home, which is a, a brilliant game with Gary McSheffrey, which is absolutely on fire. I think we beat Southend like 4-0. Um, Southend, not Southampton. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just there was a point uh, we, we were just like unstoppable. It just felt absolutely invincible. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of great memories from that season as well. It's another very early like footballing memory season uh, for me. A, a season I remember very clearly in my memory from, uh, from a young age. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so we get promoted again the following season. And obviously the expectation is that we'll go back down. But obviously Bruce's story ended there. We um we came back up and we bought we did spend money, we bought players in, but I think we look back on it and they <laughs> I'm not fully sure like we're not fully sure on what like Bruce's involvement was in the transfers and who had the final say. But when we did eventually get relegated again this season, but Bruce left in the November. His last game was actually against Villa. We lost two one. Um and I think it was David Sullivan actually blamed Bruce and a lot of the signs that he brought in. And that's probably because the players we brought in were players like Daniel Derrida. Oliver Capo. Like, Oliver Capo. Like not some some of these players played well. Like Liam Ridgewell went on to be a good player for Blues. I'd argue though his first season with us was not his best by a long way. Frank Woodrow ended up being a good, good signing for yeah, Blues. Yeah, and he was a good player like, before he joined you as well. Sure. I'd argue though this season they just weren't at it. Gary O'Connor, like, you know. Um uh, oh, what's it? Raphael Schmitz was his name. He's terrible. Johan Juru, like, <laughs> like he went on to be a World Cup international. Um, and yes, yeah, so I would argue the squad was not well equipped to stay up. And he left almost like just before the halfway point. And I think if you compare like his and McLeish's, obviously McLeish came in after him. If you compare it, there's a, there's sort of actual different. Uh, their difference in results record is actually very similar. There's actually not much of a difference at all. So I'd argue we were probably on a path to get relegated, um, even though I think we were more like 15th or 16th when he went. Um, and I think, as we mentioned in our, our bio, a lot of the reason why he left was uh, there's a takeover, supposedly was going on with Carson Young, didn't end up happening for a couple of years. And there was a lot of uncertainty over his contract. And then Wigan came in with a big offer to take him off our hands. And, and that's exactly what happened. So Bruce left, he'd been there nearly six years. And it was obviously the first time in my Life as a Blues fan, a manager, a managerial change happened. Um, so I guess the question is, what's his legacy at Blues? How is he remembered? How do I remember him? Um, it's weird because as well, obviously, since then, he's become a bit of a meme, I think it's fair to say. Like Steve Bruce yeah. is like 
we had a podcast called Wayne Rooney Scream Sexy. Obviously, it was an ironic title. <laughs> Steve Bruce really doesn't scream sexy. Like he's, I don't know, he's kind of become a really outdated. Like he's, yeah, he's like the if you were to go typical fo- modern day footballing dinosaurs, you'd have Bruce and Allardyce and Warnock. Yeah, yeah, like McCarthy. Like maybe unfair, but that's kind of just what he's become known as. I think his legacy has to be though. He was great at the time like some of the memories he was there for was you know i mentioned i talked about this season earlier the reason the kit is so beloved is because the season was so great you know like and like you know promotion again i wish i'd been a bit older to like experience all that and then finishing top 10 in the premier league those wins against villa like not to harp on about it but they must have been like amazing you know and like i'm glad i don't remember those (laughs) yeah sure exactly and i think that says a lot about how good his time like what probably was on the whole um he probably left at the right time it probably was time to bring some fresh blood in regardless but i think in nearly six years at the club he only really had one season that was like an absolute failure and the one see the one full season he had that i really remember clearly was that promotion season where we finished second and it was like it's great you know and that must have been how a lot of his time felt you maybe you maybe don't fully appreciate it in the moment Mm -hmm. but obviously within a few years of him leaving you know, the club was stuck in the championship for years and years and years. And I think the Bruce era is remembered a lot more fondly now, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that's his time at Blues. Obviously, his record in the derbies was excellent, although it did tail off towards the end. We had a few losses at the end. But, yeah, I think he has to be remembered, despite obviously going to Villa years later. He has to be remembered quite fondly, I think, I guess, at St Andrews. And very differently to Alex McLeish as well, is that the like the gap between being at Blues and being at Villa was so big, like... Yeah, of course. It was like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, of course. The, the thing with McLeish was he literally left Blues to go to Villa. Yeah. Um, Bruce was... Yeah, so he left Blues in 2007. He went to Villa in 2015, 2016? No, 2016, yeah. Yeah, so he, like nine years, like... And especially for us, like, we were like, you know, children when he was at Blues and we were like adults when he was at Villa, so yeah, it really yeah. felt like a long time, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, yeah. What, what about like his time at Villa? What are your like? Obviously, it was a lot. It was shorter and a lot later. But what are your like thoughts on that? I well, I I remember. I mean, this period was terrible. It's like the lowest of the lows. Like as much as I love this kit, probably the lowest I have ever felt as a Villa fan was in this kit, and it was just before Bruce arrived, which is. Um, so we were in the first round of the League Cup, like, like you know, having been in the Premier League for all those years to then be relegated so badly and then be in the first round of the League Cup, like, that's ooh, like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, it's like a real humbling, like, and uh, I remember we drew Luton away, and I think they were either like League One or League Two, they certainly went Championship, and like, we obviously hadn't won away from home since the opening day of the previous season. And we went there, we played the, a really strong 11, like just to win away from home. We went a goal up and then lost 3 1 with Joseph Corre scoring one of the worst own goals I have ever seen, where the ball was just like trickled towards him in the in the six yard box from like a corner and he just booted it into the net. <laughs> like he clearly didn't want to be there anymore. And the only way to get a transfer away was to just be so shit that the club didn't want him, um, which is I what I remember happened. this. <laughs> Oh god! Honestly, that was like it. It was so pathetic that game was. I like. I remember thinking, you know that that meme of the the old Accrington Stanley manager where he goes, "I'm just falling out of love with football. I don't see the point anymore." It was like that. That was like levels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So we. So obviously, Di Matteo. It just didn't work, and you know, for him, it didn't really work anywhere other than that miracle run with Chelsea. It's, Although he did do West, West Chelsea, Brom as well. Yeah. He was good at West Brom in fairness to him. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, fair. Um, but he was just not the right man for that job at the time. The rebuild that was, that was required. And the only reason he'd really been hired is because Tony Gio was like, ah, this guy's won the Champions League. What a coup. Um, yeah. And so we were really struggling. And so he was sacked after like 10 games. And we just needed an experienced championship manager that knew that could do a rebuild, but also knew how to get us promoted. Obviously we're a club that had never been relegated from the premier league. Cause like, the last time we'd been relegated was a generation before, you know, 
you see clubs now, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, throw like your Burnley, your, your typical Norwich. They know how to bounce back. You know, so many clubs come down and they just know what they need to do to get straight back up. You know, Newcastle did it the same season. Um, Leicester are doing it this year. We didn't have a clue. We spent like a hundred million quid in the summer. We signed loads of players. We basically signed a completely new squad and we did the same in January. And this is Bruce's January after he joined where we signed. This was this was the insane January we had. So we signed a young kid called Jacob Bediou to go to be uh, one for the future. Never played for us and went on a freebie. Uh, his career has completely fallen apart. Uh, we signed Neil Taylor, James Bree, Berke Bjarnason, Connor Hurahan, Sam Johnston, Henry Lansbury, and we splashed like 15 million quid on Scott Hogan on deadline day. But we were talking about Ooh. bad January buys like the other week. And we said, usually you're doing, you know, you're doing well because you don't buy anyone in January or you only buy like one. And it's, you know, how many players did I just say there? It's, three four five six like eight players in january like it's just ridiculous big money as well yeah um but obviously th these were going to be steve bruce's players um and yet scott hogan it just never worked out henry lansbury after this season just couldn't stay fit sam johnston had a shocky six month loan but then was really really good the following year when we had him on loan again Connor Horahan, I there are not enough superlatives in in our dictionary for that I could say about Connor Horahan. He was a magnificent buy for the money that we paid. Berkey Bjarnason, good player, it just no, just never really worked out. No one could ever get him in the team. Uh, James Bree, I spoke about him the other week, just just wasn't to be. Neil Taylor, a good servant, and Jacob Bediou was never really seen again. Um, but as I said, we were desperate. We were. At the lowest of the lows, Bruce was like the perfect championship manager that was available who'd probably come. And so very different to Alex McLeish. It was kind of like a relief when we got him. Like he'd definitely been putting himself out in the media because he, he knew this sort of job was coming available. Obviously, we were a huge club in the championship. And it just it seemed like it'd be a good match, at least for the years that we would be rebuilding. Um that first season, as I said, was a disaster. Regard, and it wasn't really anything to do with him. That just the club, the team, it just wasn't there. We were still having this clear out of the deadwood that got us re uh, relegated, and then loads of the players that we'd signed in the summer were no good either. Ross McCormack, Aaron Tishbola, just two that come to mind immediately. That were just it, Richie Delat. Oh. So we finished thirteenth. We didn't. We somehow didn't lose a derby this year, especially the one at St Andrews. Oh, yeah, the one at St Andrews. Oh my! So was that goodness. his first? Was that? Uh, no, it wasn't his first game. Was it wasn't it? But his like, first um, game, but it was like it was very really early on, early. wasn't it? Yeah, because yeah, remember it got announced and that he was going there, and it was the Bluesville game was being hyped up anyway because it was the first yeah. league meeting for like a few years, and then the Bruce thing got out yeah. and we were like oh <laughs> you know it's gonna and obviously, i think you, you must have said rowett at this point because obviously you had rowett who's yeah. the supposed villa fan growing up and, Br yeah, and yeah. bruce the ex-blues manager yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, but like i think back to like all the derbies that we've had i that is one that i remember dreading like really worried we oh. would lose like we were like on fire at the time i don't know how we didn't win we should have won as well 100 percent yeah, but I mean, we obviously Gary Gardner scored, didn't he, to go go mm. up and uh, ran the full length of the pitch. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, oh dear. yeah. Diehard yeah. Blues fan, Gary Gardner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we finished thirteenth. It was a, a awful, awful season. Um, and I think, oh yeah, we drew Tottenham in the third round of the FA Cup. So you know, obviously, we didn't go anywhere in the FA Cup that year. Um, the following year, this was meant to be the big year then. So obviously we'd had like eight months of Bruce. He had a full preseason. We were starting to feel the effects of the crazy summer and January that we'd had though. Like, obviously we, I said, we spent like a hundred million quid plus over these two windows. All of a sudden we hit the, the, the next summer and we can't really spend anything. 
Um, we bought, we got Glenn Whelan on a free. We gave Chris Samba a contract on a freebie. I remember. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, he would have made the worst 11 if we hadn't signed him in the Zoha. Like, oh, it was fair enough. A yeah. Waste of time. Um, <laughs> uh, who else? And then we got, but then we got the loan signings of Sam Johnston, uh, the loan signing of Robert Snodgrass. I remember that was a real coup. I was very, very excited by that one. Uh, and obviously, we got John Terry on a free as well. Um, and like, we, I think we've spoken about this before on the podcast because he was either going to Villa or Blues. Like, that was oh, the big story. Which one was he going to? I was to? certain he was coming to Blues. I wasn't even, like, nervous about yeah. it. I was like, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, like, it's happening. 100% it's happening. That's so exciting. And, yeah. But they reckon it was, like, his connection with Bruce that, like, got him in yeah. there, sort of. Yeah. Kind yeah. of swayed him. And the fact that Villa were offering probably double the money that Blues were offering. Well, I mean, we know that we were offering him an insane amount of money. And and I think um, Tommy Elphick revealed in an interview with The Athletic that, like, um, obviously he came in and just got given the captain's armband. And also, um, he also, like, had a clause in his contract where, like, if he was fit, he had to play. Like, yeah. you know, th- this is John Terry, obviously. Yeah, yes. Um, and don't get me wrong, he was amazing for us. He was He was a brilliant signing. And it's a shame we couldn't have had him for the following year because he still had it, you know. Um, mm-hmm. He could have done another year in the championship. Um, but as I said, the season didn't quite go out how we wanted to. Um, we missed out on promotion um, because we had that heartbreaking. And I know everything worked out in the end. It doesn't take it away how heartbreaking that loss to Fulham in the playoffs was. Like, it, it was it was awful. Like I, I've watched us lose cup finals, like three cup finals, and it's like really sad and disappointing. It is nothing compared to losing the playoff final. Like it's the best game to win and the worst to lose. Yeah. Um, but Fulham were the better team and they deserved to go up. And I, I just showed that even we weren't quite there. There was something just not quite working. I think you know that was there because the squad was more than capable to go off, to to go up. Do you think Bruce, like, obviously you finished fifth or fourth? Do you think Bruce should have done better with the players that he had? Do you think Automatic should have been because Card didn't Cardiff finish second Card- that year? Like Neil Cardiff, Wallace, Cardiff, up. like yeah, but they were really good in the championship that year. Mm. Like, um. He just found a way to get them firing, but we did beat them at Villa Park. Uh, Jack Grealish scored a wonder goal late on, and like they battered us and like somehow hadn't scored. Um, I forgot who, who went up top that year. Wolves, the Wolves. Yeah. I was Wolves, yeah. yeah. Like Wolves were like a they class are, above yeah, everyone else. Away, but they yeah. signed, but they signed loads of Premier League like yeah. Premier League caliber players. So, um, yeah, of course. Although we did beat them at Villa Park that season four one, which was like unreal. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think the the expectation would have been automatic promotion. Um, you know, but even in the playoffs, you know, we we got past Middlesbrough, who were a decent team at that time. I think they had Tony Pulis in charge. Yeah. Um, but obviously Fulham had gone on like this really good run, like akin to what we would do the following year, where they just looked unstoppable in like the last three months of the season. And they were always the favourites going into the playoffs. And uh unfortunately that is what happened. They they did beat us on in the final. Um but as I said, it all worked out in the end. I think had we have beaten Fulham and gone up, we would have come straight back down. Almost certainly, like that. Th- that team was good enough to go up, but it was nowhere near equipped to stay in the Premier League, and the ownership was nowhere near equipped to fund a Premier League season, um, as we saw by losing because they gambled so much on spending like a hundred hundred million quid plus paying for John Terry's swan song at Villa for a year. The club had no money by losing the playoff final. We didn't have any money, and the club nearly went bust. And and it isn't an exaggeration that cl- the club almost didn't exist because of the ownership failings. Um, we didn't know if Steve Bruce was going to stay. We didn't know if any of the players were going to stay. You know, we, we, you know, it looked like at one point we nearly had to sell Jack Greenish for three million plus Josh Onoma. Like to to think, just like a 
five, not even five years later, we'd sell him for a hundred million to Manchester City. Um, but nonetheless, we did, uh, we did survive. Uh, we didn't go under. Um, it did mean that we missed out on signing Sam Johnston permanently. Obviously, he went to West Brom instead, just because. He wanted to make sure he had a club. Like he didn't mm. want to be on Manchester City. He didn't want another loan move from Manchester United. And while he would have signed for us if we'd have gone in for him, we couldn't go in for him because we didn't have any money. Um, but in fairness, you know, um, we were able to hang on to Bruce, which was definitely a big thing, at least for me anyway. I remember thinking like, because a lot after we got the new ownership, the big rumor was Bruce was going Thierry Henry's that's going to be the new manager. And I just remember seeing these reports going, please don't do this. Please don't do I, this. I remember the when that was the rumour. I saw, you know, the meme of, um, is it from like The Office or something? It's like Ricky Gervais <laughs> when he like, is it from The Office when he like yeah. turns around and he sees like his mom and then he looks back and he goes, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Steve Bruce turned around and seeing Thierry Henry. <laughs> I think, I, I don't know what show, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know what show that's yeah, from. I, I think it's The but, Office. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I remember thinking, like I I remember the time thinking, like Thierry Henry was like a rookie manager, unproven. And it's like we've just we've we've just seen what Di Matteo was like, and that guy had managed before. Like, mm. why would you get rid of? I know we didn't go up, but why would you get rid of like your experienced, knows how to get promoted manager and bring in someone who is a complete unknown? Yes, he might be the next, I don't know, Mikel Arteta, but he could also be the next Steven Gerrard, you mm. know. Um, or Gianfranco Rooney. Zola. <laughs> yeah, Rooney. <laughs> yeah, Rooney. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, but we did not start the season very well. And it was really clear very early on that, you know, we weren't in great shape. We had a great squad. Obviously, we'd had a, a you know, despite nearly going under, you know, we'd signed the likes of Tammy Abraham, Yannick Balassi, Anwar Al Ghazi, John McGinn in the summer at Oyen Nyland. Um, you know, we got Twanzabi back on loan again. And we just didn't get going in the start of the season. But the results don't really show that. So we won on the opening night against Hull. Uh, well, we did play well, and we came, I think we came from a goal down to win 3-1. And then we had a last gasp, late 3-2 win against Wigan. and But then then we drew 2-2 with Brentford. But, like, we were, we were doing all right, but we weren't. We weren't Disjointed, great. sort of. Yeah, and, like, we then went on a really bad run, and things just seemed to be falling apart. And I remember we played Blackburn away, and we were rubbish. We were a goal down, thinking... Like, and I remember this game being the game where I went, I think he's got to go. Even though we salvaged a point at the end, Conor Horahan scored a late, late free kick. Wonderful goal. Um, and it all culminated in a really toxic night at Villa Park, where we played Preston. I don't know if you remember this game, Dan. We were in a pub together in Selly Oak. I do, yeah, I do. I had, the, I I had I remember... a stream of the game on my phone. Let me guess. Glenn Whelan taking a penalty? Yes, Glenn <laughs> Whelan's late penalty miss. It was a game where, like, I remember getting in the taxi to go to the pub and we'd just gone 2-0 up just before half time. I think Tammy Abraham, did he have a brace? He certainly scored one. And it was like, oh, okay, all right, we're gonna, we should win tonight now. And Preston were bottom of the league, let's not forget. And uh, like, by the time we get to the pub and we're a few drinks in, I remember like getting the stream up on my phone, and we were like, it was, we were two, we were three two down or something crazy. It was like we just completely fell apart. And then um, we managed to score. I think was it Yannick Balassi made it three three, and then we got a late penalty. And Glenn Wheeler missed the penalty. Bruce had had a cabbage thrown at him before the game. And uh, it to show that like the, the writing was on the wall. Oi and Nyland, I was never a big fan of Nyland. I just he wasn't a good shot stopper when he joined. He couldn't catch, he couldn't distribute. And I remember I remember being, I think it was maybe the Bolton game. We won one nil. I know that would have been under Dean. Oh, it would have been under Dean Smith, but I remember being at the Bolton game. And like he went to make a catch and he dropped it and it went out for a corner. And like everyone's going, flipping heck, Nyland. And somebody next to me went, Yeah, well, you've got to expect this with these young keepers. And I went, Sorry, mate. He's 28. He's not a young goalkeeper. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> like, yeah. But he dropped Bruce dropped him that night and he mm. played Mark Bunn instead. Like Mark Bunn hadn't played or like barely played in his career. Mm. Like it was just that sort of desperation to like something's gotta change. It's like before Dean Smith went, he just randomly dropped Tyrone Mings because he just he was just panicking and didn't really know what to Not do to, to lose, make things yeah. work. Yeah. And um yeah, he didn't survive after that. He was sacked sort of in disgrace. I think it's fair to say, like it ended mm. so badly, so toxically, so sourly. When he'd arrived, there'd been such optimism. Obviously, we didn't lose a derby under him. We won both the home games, drew both the away games. Um, but it all, it, you know, you look back on it, and I think it's fair to say, like the playoff final defeat took a lot out of the out of him, the club the team like that that and the summer that that followed and you know and it was fair play he could have walked away in that summer he chose to stick it out and and kind of see what would happen um it just wasn't to be i think in the end yeah and it's kind of interesting obviously with blues were talking like 20 years ago but with villa it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like that long ago that bruce was a villa because it was no not it was at only all. like you know like what, like six, seven, eight years ago, but um, like in the grand scheme of things. But it's interesting, we were talking about like how Bruce is kind of considered, like you mentioned a few names, like Bruce is considered this like outdated like manager, mm. but all the names we just mentioned are all the names that, so like when he was at Villa, we had Harry Redknapp. You mentioned Tony Pulis was at Middlesbrough. Yeah. Neil Warnock got promoted with, uh, <laughs> Cardiff. with Cardiff. It's weird how like they've all, and I know they've always been a bit like butt of a few jokes and stuff, but like those managers like, would like it's mad to think you couldn't imagine Warnock getting a team promoted. Allardyce now. would have been the England manager at a point around this, yeah. As well. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Like, it's mad to think how much football has changed in like these few years. Um, yeah, because it's really not that long ago. But when do you think? Because like Bruce, obviously, since then he went to he briefly was at Sheffield Wednesday, then yeah. somehow got a Premier League job at Newcastle, um, which is very rare to have like a kind of be sacked from the championship and then go into a Premier League job. And obviously the Newcastle fans hated him, even though he's kind yeah. of, you know, he is one of their own. And he did okay there in the end, given that everyone expected them to get relegated. But Yeah, yeah. I, I think the whole Eddie Howe thing since then, obviously he's done yeah. so well with the, obviously his circumstance with their takeover and stuff. But West Brom was undeniably a total failure for him. He, yeah. They were they were terrible. We out, I don't know how we only won 3-2. We outplayed them at the Hawthorns one night. And I think that was maybe his last game uh, or one of his very last games with West Brom. He was only there about 10 months. They had their lowest finish in over 20 years. So where does where do you think Bruce is now? Like, what is he finished like, as a manager? I think he is, although I keep like half expecting him to end up at like QPR or something in the next yeah, couple like of weeks. A, like... That's a great, yeah. Mm. He's probably, it feels like he's maybe quietly retired is kind of the impression yeah. we get. I mean, he left Baggies. 18 months ago nearly now so it's quite a while ago um maybe maybe he was waiting for wolves to get relegated and then he could collect like the, <laughs> the, the, the set, west midlands yeah. infinity stones you know yeah it's <laughs> coventry after that <laughs> warsaw solihull moors <laughs> like alf church um uh, uh bromsgrove sporting he's like <laughs> <laughs> um so in like bruce's time at villa do you Regret is a weird word. Do you wish it ever happened? Do you feel like a waste of time? No, no. It was definitely he would he like it ended really badly, and it it was as I said, it was like time to it was he'd had his time, and it was the right time to go. It was just a shame the way it went. Maybe he should have gone in the summer, and and probably if he looks back, maybe he he probably would have if he could have his time again, he probably would have walked in the summer, hmm. um, because his stock was quite high. Um, but he really steadied the ship and, and we were, like I said, we were completely all over the place, like off the, off the pitch, on the pitch, we were a disjointed mess and he did rebuild us. And we went, you know, I said, we finished 13th and then all of a sudden we were in the playoffs and we were so close to promotion. And, you know, a lot of the success that followed is because of him. You know, mm. the players that we went up with was mostly the players he signed in the summer. And Tommy do you think Abraham. he had a saying in do you think he had a yeah. saying in signing them? Yeah. Yeah, definitely at that time, definitely. Um, but 
you know, because we didn't really get like a, a transfer, like, um, like director in until yeah, sure. Dean Smith's appointment. But, you know, John McGinn was a Steve Bruce buy. El Ghazi was a Steve Bruce loan. Tammy Abraham, who almost, you know, b- between him and Jack Greenish, like they sing, but the, the pair of them got us promoted near enough, like with how good they were. Um, El Ghazi, cult hero, had a great, had a great time at the club. So it, it, he he was pivotal in, in signing some key players that we, we had. James Chester he, was his man, El Mohamedi, you know. I, I always thought he'd go on to make like a great director of football because he always seemed to have a, you know, yes, he had some real duds in there and like Scott Hogan and um, Nyland and, and like James Bree and like they were all, d- Bjarnason, like I really liked Bjarnason. He was a good player. It just, he was just not, it was just not the right club for him and we could never seem to get him in the team. Um, but I always thought Steve Bruce would make a good director of football, like a director of football, because he'd have he always had a decent eye for players. I thought. Yeah, I feel like at Blues he did that. Like he signed some. I mentioned a load earlier, like Robbie Savage, like David Dunn, Mikhail Fussell, uh, obviously Dugary. I don't know how involved directly he was with that, but for every one of them, he he might. There's a chance he'd bring in like a, yeah. a Pandiani, like a <laughs> you know, like. I can't believe I mentioned Yarashik earlier, you know, yeah. <laughs> you, know like, you know what I mean? Like he'd make like, you know, Julian Gray, like, you know, somewhat not necessarily terrible, but like, I feel like we signed a lot of players under Bruce in general, like a lot of, he, he got through play, like we cycled the squad a lot through him um, during his time. Um, do you think it's fair that he's kind of got the reputation that he's got now as being a bit like, is he, I don't think he'd get a champ. If he tried, I don't think he'd get a championship job now unless it was desperate. And oh. this whole sort of outdated, like, dinosaur thing, like... Well, I mean, his style of football is, like, you know, is outdated. You know, you remember when he was managing you, this was, like, like 20 years ago. And the game has mm. changed so much in that time. You know, you can tell that just by the shirts. Like, yeah. the shirt you're wearing there is really baggy. Like, there's, you know, if you went for a run in that so is shirt... Bruce. So is Bruce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, if you went for a run in that shirt, like, it's not a breathable fabric, for example. No, like, no, yeah. As well as, like, if you take this shirt, even though it's a few years old, like... Mm. It, the, the, like it's, the amount of time that's passed, sort of. Yeah, like, you can... you can. So, obviously, the, the way football is, and it's always evolving, and, you know, the, this Pep Guardiola, like, super system he's got at Manchester City at the moment, like... You know, it might be you look, but look at the way Jose Mourinho has just been sat by Roma and people going, oh, he's a dinosaur. He just, you know, it, the, the game's mm. moved on from Mourinho. I don't think it has, but it's just the game, it's different. You know, you think back it's to hard, when he was managing Chelsea, like his teams were insanely good. They were amazing. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, completely. I think like you can, even if they are a bit outdated, you can still appreciate that they were. Yeah. Like one day, one day Guardiola will be outdated. And yeah. You know, Klopp and um and all them as well. You know, it's kind of just part and parcel of it. Um, where do you where would Bruce rank? You don't have to give like an exact number, but like if you were to rank all the Villa managers you've seen, would he be like in the middle? Would he be down the bottom? Like, uh, he'd probably be in. He'd certainly be in like the top quarter. I think. Really? What the top? Quarter? I think really? so. Wow. You think you think about it. We had some. We had a lot of shit managers. That is true. I guess that is true. He's well, definitely top yeah, half. True. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Obviously, he wouldn't be ahead of Emery. He wouldn't be ahead of Smith O'Neil. or Martin o- or Martin O'Neill. But would after that, a... would he above be above Julio? Sh- yeah, probably. I don't think he'd, he'd probably be below Sherwood. Like Sherwood was like a flash in the pan, but it was like a great <laughs> six. Mo- like it was an amazing six months under Tim Sherwood. Fair enough. Fair enough. Like, but. You know, but yeah, he probably he probably probably just beat Tim Sherwood. Fair enough. I think with Blues, he'd have to be, despite you know obviously his connections to Villa and like you know relegation and so on. He's easily one of the better managers we've had in our lifetime. I think I'd probably have Hugh. I'd have Hugh and above him, despite everything that happened with McLeish. I, I think I personally remember like McLeish's era. I have like more of a you know a fond memory for. So, um, and you can listen to our second city story on McLeish to find out why. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'd probably put him above him. I'd probably put Rowett above him, just for, again for that kind of personal connection. But he'd easily be. We've had a lot of duds as well, but yeah, he'd, he'd be up there. You know, I think he does. He does deserve credit. Um, you know, looking back for what he did at Blues. So yeah, maybe that's a podcast for another day. In the summer, maybe we'll rank the the managers. Rank the managers. Oh yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. So that's Bruce's career as like a manager. Um, 
But let's get to the elephant in the room, which is uh, Bruce's other career. Not as a player, but... Um, but as a wordsmith. As a wordsmith. As a Shakespearean wordsmith. Yeah. Um, kind of a cult classic story, but maybe becoming a little more well-known now, um, is that Bruce, in the late 90s, when he was the manager of Huddersfield, uh, dabbled in a bit of uh, a bit of Agatha Christie, a bit of Nines <laughs> Out. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Bruce wrote a genuinely wrote a crime trilogy of novels um, in his spare time, and the beauty of this is it's about uh, and I'm not making this up. This is true. Um, it's about a footballer called Steve Barnes. Who is the manager of Leddersford Town, who wear Not blue and white stripes. Yeah, who also wear blue and white stripes. And he's like a, a manager turned detective when a player in the first book, when a player is murdered. And the yeah, Steve Bruce wrote like a trilogy. They're like a one draft hit, like 100, <laughs> 150 pages each. Um and Callum, I believe so the trilogy is called they're all like football themed crime yeah. stories. And for years people were like, Are these real? Are they not? And yeah. I think it's kind of widely become there's so many hints in the books to like real things that have happened in Bruce's yeah. life. There's a lot of connections there. And he, I think he, when he was at Villa, he did an interview where someone asked him about it and he kind of confirmed it was real. Um, so they've kind of become this like underground thing, but I believe, so the trilogy is called striker sweeper and defender. I believe the yes, trilogy they are. all got like an they explanation are, yeah. mark. And I believe you have the blurb for sweeper in front of us. If we could hear a little I... rendition of what we're in store for. It... Yeah, so this is the second of the three. Steve Barnes, manager and coach of Leddersfield Town, has taken the team to the top division. He's heavily involved in developing tactics to keep the sides a serious contender for promotion. When Steve assists Sam Milton, an old employee of the club, he soon finds himself with more than a death in suspicious circumstances. Sam is not what he seems. He may even be the man with a terrible past. It is that past which catches up with Steve, who finds himself caught up in shade in the shady world of danger, espionage and revenge. Steve has the key to unlock the past, but there are fanatics armed and dangerous who will stop at nothing to keep their secrets from the world. This second novel by Steve Bruce, former Manchester United captain and now esteemed manager, is fast and exciting. It will be enjoyed by all ages and, <laughs> and both sexes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I do remember that. I remember that actually. Um, uh, so, slightly dated uh, yeah. line from Steve there. Um, you could have bought it for five pounds fifty in the UK on this one. Um, really? But but this one is currently on eBay at two hundred pounds. Yes. Yeah, so so that's the thing. So it's really hard to get copies of these books because they're so they're really rare and expensive now. Um, so I would recommend instead, there's a podcast run by, you know, Josh Widdicombe, the comedian? Yes. Um, he does a podcast called Quickly Kevin, uh, which is like a, a, a 90s football-themed podcast. And he had, um, do you know Ivo Graham, the comedian? He was on Taskmaster. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he, they, they had him on as a guest, and they have done a series of episodes where they basically read them and kind of break it down. And so if you want to get like the full insight into the madness of this trilogy, I cannot recommend them enough. They are yeah. so funny. <laughs> Um, it's so funny listening to them talk about it. Um, uh, like truly, like uh, there's so like there's a thing in the books that like Steve Bruce won't, uh, Steve Barnes won't help his country, <laughs> like stop terrorists because he doesn't believe in helping his country because he was never capped for England as a footballer. <laughs> That's like a thing in the books. Um, and yeah, they're the most just like one draft, like wandering, like relentlessly, like aimless. You know, like you know, like the room, the film, how it has like yeah. no direction. <laughs> it's kind of like that in novelistic form. Um, so yeah, fully recommend checking out the podcast. Have a listen. There's like uh, Steve Steve Barnes is like a bit of an arsehole. I don't know if Steve Bruce, yeah. <laughs> kind of rude, violent, womanizing like character. I don't know if Bruce deliberately tried to make him this way. But the bit when they talk about the third book is my is probably my favorite. Where uh, so the plot of Defender is that Steve Barnes signs like a Brazilian defender and he goes missing. So the plot is that he goes miss is it's like a missing persons case. Yeah. Um, and so Steve Barnes goes to Rio de Janeiro to investigate. But the book is like, he basically finds him pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> and so the rest of the book is just him wandering around, sightseeing around <laughs> Rio de Janeiro. It's like, imagine if like 
halfway through like the godfather they find out who the mole in the family is and so the rest of the films then just sightseeing in new york (laughs) um yeah truly amazing there's a lot of him just talking about his car uh i don't know why there's just it's just the most all over the place book ever it's like really badly written truly iconic and just loads of little like there's like real connections in his life to like there's people <laughs> who are fictional but they're clearly based on other real people in like his football in life yeah. um and he compares like action scenes to like um football in terms like so there's a bit when he's trying to someone's trying to like, he's in a fight with someone and steve bruce is right and describes Steve Barnes, he gets away from his attacker by like dropping his shoulder like Darren Huckabee and like gets away. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it's just uh yeah, fully recommend the podcast. Very, very funny. Um and if anyone wants you... to wants to send us a two hundred pound copy of the book, we oh, will re- we please. will do an audio book of it. We'll read oh, the whole 100%. thing. hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. That would be amazing. Um yeah, I think that's just fantastic. Whatever failures Bruce has had as a manager or as a player. It cannot come close to uh, his writing career, sadly. But fair enough, Steve, for giving it a go. Um, yeah, not exactly knives out, but I, I love. No, that but I tell you go. what, if he like, did, if he did another, everyone one needs a now, hobby. If he did another oh, one now, massive. he'd make millions. It'd be huge. Oh, mate, that's what he should do. Instead of like pissing about at the baggies, like yeah. get on this, Steve. Like, what's he doing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's a striker sweeper defender, and I think that just about wraps us up here, yeah. Cal. Um, for a second city story um let us know if there's anyone in particular you'd like us to see uh maybe yeah. on this series soon we've done Hes- uh, we've done hesky hotter mcleish and bruce so there's loads more that we can do um so let us know and yeah we'll be back next week with a bit more of a normal episode but we hope you enjoyed this one uh yeah. i mean i've been because we're time traveling here dan i can tell you how the week's gone like Man, I'm so glad we beat Sheffield United. That last minute winner from Ollie Watkins, beautiful stuff. And then we've gone and beat Chelsea three <laughs> one. And then we've we've gone and turned over Man United at Villa Park. And who would have seen a John McGinn hat trick on the cards? Like unbelievable well, stuff. That was impressive. But obviously, we had our derby against Baggies last week, one of our biggest games of the season. Um, and I mean, uh, Cody Dramer hat trick, uh, remarkable. Duke uh, off the bench making it four four nil. Um, Freedom of the City given to Tony Mowbray, uh, Rooney in the crowd watching on crying. Unbelievable. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, we'll be back with, uh, as normal next week though. Um, so yeah, uh, you can follow us everywhere, including Twitter and TikTok. That's with the handle Second City Pod. Yeah, that's 2ND City Pod. Subscribe on whatever platform you're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, the Google Podcast, the, the whole lot. Uh, leave a like and a five star review because they go a long way. And uh, yeah, until next week, Dan, I'll see you then and up the villa. Cheer on the villa, keep right on. See you next time.